I am excited and terrified and mortified and all kinds of ifides. My code is broken. My code is broken. From Huntsville, Alabama, you are listening to My Code is Broken, a podcast by developers for everybody. Here is your host, Dan Nagel. My code is broken. My code is broken. Greetings, my fellow nerds. I have two great interviews with the focus being Pacquiao. My interviewees are Brian Powell, founder of Metabon and inventor of Pacquiao, and Cal Newman, an entrepreneur and Pacquiao advocate. You'll hear from both. Their stories are interspersed throughout the episode. We cover work, education, and code. Let's dive in. First up, Brian. Topic one, Metabon. A um, few things that interested me that jumped out is you left college to start it. Yeah, so I did. Um, I had been consulting uh, since I was about 17 years old and doing all web-based apps and things like that. Do you mind saying how old you are now? I'm 28. 28. No. Okay. Um, so that was, I've been doing this 16 or 17, so about 12 years now. And uh, so I had had some experience under my belt. And um, Where did you first start programming on? I started in PHP. At home? At home. Okay. At, in high school? In high school. Self-taught, well, I assume self-taught. Self-taught. I had, I surrounded myself with some good mentors as well. Um there were two developers that worked for Highway um, Internet Solutions back when Highway still did um, programming okay. and web stuff. So, was there a particular purpose to your PHP? Were you trying to program a game, a next the next Facebook, or was it just some itch that you needed to scratch? Um, it was really just an interest for me, and it was a way to to make a few extra bucks. Um, I, I was just, I had always been fascinated by software. I had, uh, my dad is a programmer and so he had sort of taught me a lot of different things, uh, even earlier than 16. And I think I, I remember writing my first program in basic when I was like 12 ish. And so I'd always been interested in programming and the web was just a really easy way to get started. And yeah, I felt like I could learn a little bit and contribute a lot to you know, the web as a thing. So you were doing paid consulting at 17, writing PHP. Yeah. And then you went off to college, and what did you major in? So I majored, actually changed my major. So I was there for about a year and a half. I started in computer science. I wasn't thrilled with that. I changed my major to business. That was good, but I really quickly realized that the best way to learn about business was to be in business and that I felt like I had learned more from consulting prior to college uh, and I was still consulting in college as well. I felt like I, I was learning more doing the consulting work and being in business than I was sitting in class. So, did, you, did you go to UAH? I did go to UAH and it's not a bad program. I think a lot of it's just a reflection of how I prefer to learn. Um, I don't, I'm not a classroom sort of person. Did you start Metabon while you were in college? So I... When did you file the LLC? Or is it an LLC? It is an LLC. When did you file that? Um, it was in January. It would have been January of the year that I left school. I'm not sure when I... So I don't remember the year, but then September of that year is when I officially started working full-time for Metabon. Um, if that makes sense. So, like so you... Six months. So this was sort of a self-employed entity while you were in college, and then you left school to hit it full-time. Right. And so I, I think you didn't finish your degree. I did not finish my degree. And, and in fact, I didn't, I didn't drop out. At least I didn't think about it that way. I left for a period of time to see if I could make a go of the business. 
And, and since you were successful, you never bothered to go back. And I've never gone back. And I, I fully intended to. I haven't. Uh, maybe one day. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hoping, you know, they give me a degree one day. That's what I'm Honorary doing. degree. <laughs> Honorary degree. Brian Powell. <laughs> Out of nowhere, uh, you need to hire a few more people in the area. Right. <laughs> Before they do that. Um, You're getting there. Getting there. Yeah. We just... Just, yep. just wait for Pacquiao to become the next WordPress, and then... There we go. We're on our way. Let's pause a moment on Brian's college career and jump to Kyle Newman. He has a degree, but not what you'd expect. One is, and I've thought of this in a, as a, for a while, I've kind of thought of you as like the Ron Perlman of software development. Because I see something going on, I'm like, this is an interesting project. Kyle's in it! <laughs> I mean, you have your hands in just about everything. Is, is that a fair assessment? That is a fair assessment of my personality. I, I am very, uh, I see things that are bright and shiny, and I like to be a part of them. Uh, I really want to help people, and I really want to contribute, and I really want to do a lot of things. Um, I'm trying to, to, to get better at that. and, and Get better at uh, more do projects? Fewer, do fewer things uh, better. So do you start a lot of projects and they fizzle out because you're spread too thin? I, 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 have, I have seen that happen before. Okay. So. so how many projects are you working on right now? Oh, I, I, I don't know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> let's see, I'm helping out with, with Open Huntsville. Uh, I'm working on that. I've got the day job, of course. I've got um, some consulting work that I do. I've got some... Uh, business ideas that I have, uh, and those are really the big ones right now. Are some of them? Are these all community projects, or are these entrepreneurial, or entrepreneurial. Mix, mix of both? Well, so some, you know, if you're sometimes when you're starting a business, I mean, you have to you have to build a community, uh, and and you have to provide value. So, in that sense, they they are community projects. Like one, it's not completely not coding, but uh, like you, I, I want to tell stories, right? So you're you're, right. you're 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 interviewing people. You're t- telling the stories of of developers in the area or developers wherever you get to to uh, to meet them. Uh, I want to kind of do kind of want to do that with my family. You know, I've got grandparents that are getting older, and they've got stories. You know, family or oral, oral history uh, that I'm just not going to remember to tell my grandkids. So I want to document that. Uh, and wait, so. Are these code projects or are these something else? Because you're more of the audio video is 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 what I'm looking AD, at. AV AV stuff. Mm-hmm. I'm only really familiar with your code projects. I didn't know you. Were well, this is just this is AV. this is a, a germination, you know, it, it, a seed in the back of my head that I, I like to do. And, and then there's some other stuff, you know, um, you know, as far as coding, I, I want to. I'm I might be working on something with a local a local fabrication shop in town, uh, Mind Your Labs in that I, I want to have a web front end to be able to uh, create a meme and then ship it to them and, <laughs> and see what happens, you know. I love the memes. What do, you, what do you think your strong suit is as far as good at UI, good at asking questions? What, what's your strong suit? De- definitely in that place, asking the question. I, I really like UI. I think it's very important. I, I'm not going to say that I'm the best. I, I try to be a, a, a jack of all trades and a master of none, in in, in that respect. You try to be a master of none. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, yeah. I, I'm getting too good at this. Let me abandon. <laughs> uh, maybe so. It just seems like uh, <laughs> the way it's flowed. Uh, but I definitely enjoy uh, being that that glue in between the 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 more technical and the more business or customer. Um, I noticed that. You're going back to grad school. I am. After an 11 year break. Yes, I feel. Thanks for making me feel old. <laughs> it's okay. I, I may be going back uh, next fall, and that'll be after 12 years. So, <laughs> why go back after so long a break? What, what compelled you to do that? So, uh, there are a couple of things. You know, I, I feel that. I need more education, you know, whether it's, you know, and I try to, you know, self-educate, you know, learn on the, on the internets and, and read books and stuff, but also uh, the, the UAB program is nice, it's an engineering program, and we're a town full of engineers, so 
you know, part of me would like to join that social club. I'm not going to lie, but uh, but also they've got a they're very uh, leadership and and uh, they're focused on the things that I would like to grow that I see I'm stronger in, and that's not necessarily the you know the bang out an out you know the world's best algorithm. It might be interfacing with with th- that type of, of what programmer and the customer. What was your bachelor's and what's going to be your master? My bachelor's is communication arts with an emphasis in public relations, so lots of writing of prose. And this this one is going to be a master's of engineering in information engineering and management. Okay. So you're a software engineer? Uh, Software developer, yes. Software developer. Yes. Without a direct bachelor's in computer science That's or correct. engineering, the, the classical majors that you see with associated with software development. Mm-hmm. And do you feel not having that hard proof of knowledge, such as the college degree in engineering, could be holding you back in your career? Is that part of why? I think I think in some respects it does. As far as being able to do my job, I, I, I don't think so. You know, you, you, well, one, you have all t- different types of developers. You have, you know, developers that are better at UI or better at at, at uh, real time or better better at whatever. And then you have, you know, uh, developers that are better at asking questions and getting getting good requirements and demanding good requirements. Uh, so you've got a, a wide range of, of skills to have a good a good development team. Uh, so I think that's good. But in our town, engineers are good. Okay, so you talked a bit about the revenue split before, how it's the majority of consulting. What kind of consulting do you do? Yeah, so today um, we still do mostly um, web-based applications. We still do some mobile work as well, but we really consider ourselves to be a web company. So we build web-based apps for lots of um customers on the the private sector side we don't do any defense contract what are your preferred frameworks for web apps and mobile apps uh so of course we use pacquiao for as much of the web stuff as we can we do approximately 70 percent of our web apps in pacquiao the rest we do in ruby on rails or node Uh, we actually still do some php as well and then for mobile we do most of our mobile work in Ruby Motion, which is a way of building iOS and Android apps in Ruby. That's neat. I've, I've never used that one. Yeah, Ruby Motion is fantastic. We've shipped some really big projects with it without any issues. Um, it has the advantage of it compiles to native bytecode, and so you're not increasing the size of your app package or anything like that. Uh, have you tried Xamarin? I haven't used Xamarin. Is it the license fee that prevents you from trying it? I, you know, I don't really have a reason for not trying it. Um, I, we, I personally have done both native and Ruby Motion. I've just not had a need to try anything else. I've done native on both sides, Java, Swift, and I mean, it's a time sink writing yeah. writing it twice. Yep. I've barely touched Xamarin. Uh, Xamarin just recently gave me a free license for my open source projects. So that's nice. And then I touched a bit on building HTML5 based. Mm -hmm. Have you tried HTML5 based? So HTML5 based mobile apps? Yes, Yes. as in like uh, you have. Yes, so Is it slow as snot for you? No, not if you do it right. So the way, we actually built a lot of our prototypes um, in that manner. So it's sort of a native wrapper around an HTML5 application that's bundled with the um, project. So what we typically do is use native navigation controls um, and and where we're transitioning between pages and things, we'll do all of that natively, but then present the content, present the interface um, within Okay, so you're, you're doing a hybrid approach. It's a hybrid, yeah. Okay, that's the smart way to do it. I did it pure uh, web UI render. And it wasn't even dome, it was canvas. Yeah. And that dragged to the ground. So I imagine like you're doing native controls, 
um, web render mm -hmm. and not purely dome manipulation. You're, right. pro you're probably good to go. Yeah, it works great. We've not had any issues with it. Okay, I'll keep that one in mind. Okay, so is there more about Metabon? When when I started Metabon, it was kind of as a covering around my own consulting work. Um, you know, it was it was me. I had some clients that I was doing work for, um, and that's kind of what I envisioned the company being is just a wrapper for my, around the consulting work that I was doing personally. Um, the first project that I ended up landing after you know working for Metabon full time was a project that I couldn't do myself. Um, do you know when that was? I don't. Um, had to have been around fall of two thousand and seven. That's when I is around when I started okay. working full time for the company. So it was around that time frame, and it was a huge project. It was um sort of a CRM tool, web-based CRM tool for um, that was going to be resold and licensed to banks, and they were going to use it for all of their customer relationship management. So uh, we built that in Rails, and I ended up hiring a contractor to help. And I don't remember, it was close to full-time for a few months. Was that a big deal for you? Did you... Did you think of that as this is a huge stepping stone for the company or was that just something, okay, I got to hire help? Uh, it was, yeah, I was really excited because I knew that my bills were going to be paid for a while. Uh, so that was great. Um, and I, I don't know, I guess I, uh, yeah, I guess I, I started seeing that, hey, this isn't that hard to go find someone to help work on these projects and we can deliver really good web-based apps, you know, I guess it kind of did get me thinking about what we could possibly do with the company. Would it have really hurt you if you hired this guy and he turned out to be incompetent? I mean, was this something that would have sunk your venture? Um, maybe. There's always been a big emphasis on peer reviews and making sure that the work that's getting delivered is really good. Did, so. you, did you go through a lengthy vetting process with him before you hired him? Yeah, and I mean, he was hired as a contractor, not as a full-time employee. So, so you could have fired him quickly if you needed right. to. Exactly. It, it was never really a concern. And so that's the first life of the company is um, me doing consulting, and I had a team of contractors. And then about three and a half years ago, uh, there were several contractors working for the company. We were working on some, some really cool projects uh, with recurring customers and things like that. And I finally decided that I actually wanted to see what building a company would be like. And so hired one of the contractors on as the first full-time employee. Um, and then pretty quickly hired on the second one. And uh, since then, for the past three and a half years, we've been slowly growing the full-time team while continuing um, our work with outside contractors as well. So we're up to seven full-time employees now uh, with contractors there's about 12 people that work for the company and you've got a contract workflow of coming in completion another one coming in completion right. we prioritize recurring uh, relationships and rec or recurring work from existing relationships well that makes perfect sense it's a, it's a lot cheaper to retain a customer than to find a new one it is and we're really picky with the customers that we work with we turn a lot of people down um, oh, that's, that's yeah. interesting. And there's is a, it because it's not part of your core interests, or is it you think it'd be too much? So there's, I kind of look at it as a moral responsibility to some extent. So if someone comes to us with money, but an idea that we don't think is going to work. Is this one of those, I have an idea, but I need a programmer type deals? Right. We usually turn those down. I mean, we'll, we're happy to talk with those people and, you know, that's turned into to work for us a couple of times, but most of the time we're concerned that the product will fail as soon as it's to market for one reason or another. And we don't feel good taking people's money knowing that <laughs> it's probably not going to work out. So if you think the project will fail, but you would have gotten paid anyway because you delivered it, you wouldn't feel right about that. No, we, we've not taken on those projects. Or we don't think the project is going to be successful. Because, I mean, think about it. 
it's it so there's the moral aspect of it where we don't want to just take someone's money but it doesn't do us any good beyond paying our immediate bills like it doesn't do anything for building the business well i know that that's a very interesting take on it because i've heard the old contractor story it's like you know i'll work on whatever you want right but not that's that not way. how you operate no not at all um we so the first the first thing that we figure out when we're approached by a new customer is are they are they a good customer um, do we think that they're going to be good to work with will they trust us to do our job are they looking for someone just to write code or are they really looking for a partner someone to collaborate with on their project um, and then once we've established that we think you know hey we could work together uh, we vet the project and we find out more about what it is they're building and we'll reject it if we're not interested in it personally so if if it's an entertainment type application uh i'm trying to think of an example i, I can't come up with one off the top of my head but where it doesn't really serve any useful value in the world we might pass on it just because it's not that interesting to us what about um apps that look decent but has been done a hundred times before like another dating website would you turn that down um maybe it depends i mean if they have if they're doing something interesting with it uh you know we might jump on it but if it's just like if they're not trying to innovate not trying to improve what's already out there and they're just so copycatting the dating website for people who only eat brown eggs versus white oh no that's, that doesn't sound like a good idea. <laughs> not, I mean, you think about that, and there's just nothing interesting about solving a problem like that. And there's so many things out there like that. Um, you know, like we've been approached before to build like the Uber of X. X right. Y, and it's like, okay, but that's, that's not that interesting uh, usually. At least the ones that have been pitched to me so far haven't been very interesting. <laughs> It's let's let's there's a business model that's been successful. Let's copy that and try to make it successful in some slightly different way. It's Facebook for why, right? Yeah, it's less interesting. We've talked about Open Huntsville a few times already. It's a bit like LinkedIn for Huntsville locals. Here's Cal again. So do you do you mind stating the what what's the back end for? Open Huntsville. What's it running on? It's tech stack. Okay, so Open Huntsville is running on. Uh, so the the web framework is is Pacquiao, which is a Ruby framework. That's Pacquiao. Is it Pac Yo? Pac Pacquiao. 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 If, if you know a boxer that has a name, it's kind of, it kind of <laughs> sounds like that. Did, did um, you get that pronunciation direct from the creator? Y- Yes, but I might have forgotten. Maybe I'm wrong. I, I don't. I don't know. Maybe. I'm trying to remember how he said it, but yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll go with Pacquiao, and then he can correct me later. <laughs> Pacquiao. Actually, Pacquiao. what is was the correct pronunciation? Pacquiao. Two syllables. Pacquiao. Pacquiao. Yeah, just two syllables. Yeah, I mean, people call it whatever. Um, you don't have a strong preference one or the other. Pacquiao is my preference but some people talk about it like they say it differently and that's fine you're just pleased that they use it yep exactly (laughs) right Okay, so yeah, we've got we've got Pacquiao that's, that's doing all, all the 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 movement inside of the app and, and handles your, your your views and your your controllers and, and all that good stuff. And then we've got a Postgres uh, on the the database side, uh, and it's running on Heroku. Heroku. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we I really like I've I've begun, be, really uh, started liking Heroku and just the way that you can easily deploy uh, to it. Uh, and the way it handles scaling, and, and if, if need be, and, and right now the Open Huntsville, it's, it's very low uh, need for any of that. I mean, we're, we're just on the free plan. But doesn't the free plan go to sleep after a while? It does, but so the site just goes away, and you're you're okay with that? I've never not been able to access it. 
Oh, there it is. Okay, slide, so it, it, slide it, delay. It was a slight delay, but okay. We we could blame my Wi-Fi. <laughs> Or, or maybe it was asleep, and, and maybe just Hiroki just... So I woke it up. it up. Yeah. Now, so the main question is why Pacquiao? Because that's a fairly obscure framework. So what's what's funny about it is we were we talked about doing the site in WordPress because everybody on the team had used WordPress before. But I had been using uh, Pacquiao for another project, and it's local, and we were... You know, Open Huntsville is all about Huntsville, so we said, why not? And it's been fun, and, and I like it, and it seems more responsive than, you know, I like it better than WordPress as far as de- develop, developing custom apps. Uh, I mean, granted, you have a lot more to pick from in the, in the plugin gallery from, from WordPress, but... No, Bob, have you considered... Now, was the main driver... Pacquiao and that drove all the other architecture decisions like you wanted to use Pacquiao and from that you chose Ruby and from that you chose Heroku because Heroku has good Ruby support and from that you chose Postgres because Heroku has good Postgres support so it was was at the chain of decisions basically yes So when did you begin Pacquiao? So I mean, I'm sure I'm sure it was hitting in your head, you know. But when did you decide, yeah. okay, this is going to be a thing? So the initial commit um, was on August twentieth, two thousand eleven. But seeing this reminds me that Pacquiao, the project existed before August twentieth, two thousand and eleven, for about a year. But we wiped the commit history when we made it public. Um, I've done that too. I w- it was embarrassing because I didn't really ever expect to release it as an open source project. <laughs> I, I did that too. I, my Pakistaner app, I zapped a lot of the commit history. Yep. Just because I don't think there's anything bad in there, but I didn't know for sure because, you know... I might have committed a swear word or two. I mean, I, yeah, you know, just just random stuff like that. Yeah, and I mean, you're also concerned about like uh, passwords or something like that. Yeah, I think I may have committed, you know, some keys at one point because mm-hmm. it's my own personal repo. I don't care. Yeah. So August twentieth, two thousand eleven. That's about the. I think that's the exact date that the first uh, Pacquiao release came out. Now, how did it get the name Pacquiao? Uh, my friend in San Francisco. His name's Paul Chang. He's a designer. Uh, we partnered with his company for a long time. They were our design partner. And uh, I was talking to him about Pacquiao, some of the ideas, and he suggested calling it Pacquiao. And I thought it was crazy for a while um, because it's hard to um, hard to spell if you're familiar with the, the yeah, boxer, he, Manny Pacquiao. He, his last name is impossible to spell. <laughs> and so Paul's like, no, 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 just rename it. Just say P-A-K-Y-O-W. Um, so why not the C in there? Um, yeah, so there were there were two variations, P A K Y O W and one other one. I don't know if it was maybe A H. Yeah, I don't know what the other one was, and we settled on P A K Y O W. It actually wasn't my favorite, but I put a poll out, and that was the winner. So what was that? I, I had a visual of you going to some domain registration, like, oh, that's taken, oh, that's taken, oh, that's, okay, that one's good. No, I mean, it, it, it wasn't a search like that. Uh, it just happened to be available, um, but it has, you know, meaning behind it as well. Um, so I enjoy watching um, some boxing, not, I'm not a huge that, fan. That's where you got the logo? Yeah, so Pacquiao is loosely named around Manny Pacquiao, who's the famous Filipino boxer and uh, it, some of his fighting style is uh, you could tie in with some of the goals of Pacquiao. Um, and do you just happen to like the color red? Yeah, well boxing and red go together. Okay. So and it's Ruby just, it just, just red. And yeah, that all fits together. It all fits together. Okay, so there's there's a method to the madness. There, Yeah, it's still madness, but there's a method to it. So 
2011, first public commit, back up a year, first, you're really deep diving into Pacquiao. Right. Uh, and has this just been an ongoing commitment ever since then? Yeah, um, steady stream of work. What would you consider to be uh, the allocation of resources towards your current customers and goals there and resources towards developing Pacquiao? So I log all of my time religiously, as does everyone else in the company. Are you the main core contributor to Pacquiao? Yeah, there's... um... I do the, the bulk of the work. So this year, um, just about 1,500 hours of work have been logged on Pacquiao. Is that just by you this no, year? that's from everyone the company. inside of the company. That's a very significant commitment. It is a significant commitment. And that doesn't include work that's gone on outside of the company because we do get outside contr- contributions as well. My experience with developing open source is that there is outside contributions, but they're so minor that, or do you have uh, significant contributions? Yeah, we actually have, the contributions that we have are major. Okay, well, you're a step ahead of me there then. Because um, yeah. I, don't, I don't see that in my mind. I don't know why that is either, because I hear your, what you're saying a lot of you get insignificant contributions, and it may just be what we put out there. I think you, it, yours is a actual programming tool and environment which attracts actual programmers, whereas mine is, you could argue, mostly an end-user application that would have sure. no interest in ever writing a line of code. Yeah, that's true. Like today, uh, I just merged a pull request from a guy. His, he's based in Poland, and I think Poland, and it was a major, major feature towards the 1.0 release. And he just did it. I didn't ask him to do it. He surpri- completely surprised me with it. Right. And Ruby is probably far more approachable than C++, which is what my app True. is really right the, Yeah. It also has that going for it. Uh, so, so it's a st- the style of project. Right. That's the big difference. Yep. Why would a business, in which I assume you're in the pursuit of profit, spend so much resources on a project just to give it away open source so it's a really good marketing tool in and of itself Um, the fact that we have a popular open source project um, you know it it exposes people to the company in in ways that they wouldn't be exposed um, otherwise I mean we're having this interview largely because we (laughs) invest in Pacquiao Um, aside from that uh we have a better tool to use um, to build applications for our customers. But why not keep the tool internal? Yeah. So... Then you can make them pay a license fee. Yeah. I don't like that approach to business, for one. Um, I think if something's truly useful, it should be shared. Um, Also, you do get... So the, the idea, the more you give away, the more you you get back sort of applies in the open source world because um, we could keep it closed source, uh, charge licensing fees, things like that. The problem with that is you're never going to get outside opinions or outside perspectives on the project or outside contributions. If you open source it, um, not only do you stand to gain outside contributions, but you have other people who aren't affiliated with the company who are thinking about the problems that you're solving, who are contributing thoughts and ideas and direction to the project. Um, And that's pretty huge. Have you gotten consulting business referrals through your Pacquiao project? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yes, for sure. Um, Directly related people find out about Pacquiao. They see who's behind it. They come to the Metabon site and they contact us for work. That has happened. Okay. And, you know, it's, it's a, you know, partly giving back. Uh, we think it's a really cool idea. We want other people to be building things in this way. Uh, we don't want to be selfish and keep it for ourselves. Um, that's certainly an aspect of it. But it is also good for business um, okay. that we open sourced this.
Now, uh, the obvious question is, is, why not Rails? Well, so, uh, you know... You'd be in good company with places like GitHub, Hulu, and Twitter, at least version 1.0 of Twitter. They were all built in rail, Rails. And, and again, you know, the, the decision in, in framework was going back to, you know, it's a local thing, and, and we're all about Huntsville, uh, so let's, let's do that. So, we, you know, we didn't really consider Rails. Can you make the case for the Silicon Valley firm that is not particularly in love with Huntsville for them to choose something like Pacquiao over Rails? Because saying it's local, that's a good argument if your business is Huntsville. But if your business is outside of Huntsville, where the project is made, it's not that strong of an argument. I, can't, I don't know if I could make strong arguments. I, I believe that, that the, the team behind Pacquiao could. I, I don't have the, the, the data they, they have. I know that, that uh, Brian has done some, some low performance testing, and, and it's pretty snappy. And, and I hear that, that Rails is not that snappy. Um, True. There is a reason that Twitter abandoned it, mm-hmm. although it seems to be holding up okay for GitHub. So mm-hmm. maybe... Um, maybe they just didn't use it well the first time around. Or, or maybe, maybe they just, you know, if they're very comfortable in it, they know a lot about it, then... It... Now, you, another reason you chose Pacquiao is because you were somewhat already familiar with it? That's correct. Um, so what was the learning curve? Did you already know Ruby before diving into it? I have been, I mean, I, I have been learning Ruby, right? So I, I wouldn't say that I'm a master at it, but I've been le- learning Ruby since I started working on the other project, which was GoRallyPoint.com. And what we wanted to do with that was we heard that the, some local municipalities were passing around spreadsheets to, to make sure that, you know, soccer fields weren't double booked and, and, and pavilions and, and all that. And we said, well, wait, we could, we could probably do that on the internets and and uh, so we started working on that project uh, a while back and, and that's what that's what that was my introdu- introduction to Pacquiao and Ruby and and all that so you, you learned it to work on an initial web app now how did you find Pacquiao for that initial app Brian is part of that team <laughs> so the the, 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 uh, the, the lead committer uh, founder of, of Pacquiao. So the the inventor of Pacquiao was on your team. Yeah. So that that was a strong voice of support. Well, and and for honestly, Pac- he, he wasn't as strong. He was like, hey, hey guys, we could do it in this, or you know, if you guys want to. Like, well, I imagine it, it may have also helped him from that. He obviously wants to continue developing Pacquiao and make Pacquiao mm-hmm. amazing. Well, yeah. more amazing than it already is. Now, so working on this project with your team probably gave him additional real-world insights to help improve it. Was he improving this as you were working on this? He found some things? Yeah, yeah we, we definitely gave him feedback, and he is, you know, and even throughout the process with, with Open Huntsville as well, you know, it's like, uh, you know, one time, uh, I think, we, so we, we all tried to sit down and prototype everything and get everything working in a weekend. And for the most part, we did. But for, it was a good three-hour stretch. I was getting this one error, and I did, I could not figure it out. It's like, why? Why is this? And so finally, I, you know, I got uh, Brian on Slack. And it's like, oh, yeah, that's because you don't have a view for that in this place. So, because it was some random error. And it's like, oh, I'll fix it. So, so okay. I'm sure he's fixed it in, in the newest release of it. Well, I'm, I'm sure. And eventually the audience will grow, and you may find some random forum post or stack overload flow answer to your question that you're looking for. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm sure that is the ultimate goal. So you've been using Rails since 2005. 2005, summer and 2005. That, that is like right around when was, Rails was first introduced. Mm-hmm. So you were very early adopter. Yeah. Now, what is it that you didn't like about Rails that inspired you to start working on Pacquiao? So Rails is awesome. It's a good framework and people should use it. Yeah, a lot of very high profile sites use it. Right. Twitter used to run on Rails. GitHub still does. GitHub does. Yeah. I mean, there's... A lot of the big uh, famous startups um, 
run on rails or ran on rails at some point in their life. Um, and you know, I was just, I remember the first time I saw, um, Ruby on rails code, I was like, wow, this is the way the application should be built. And it wasn't until building several rails applications at Metabon that I started questioning parts of it. And really it just didn't mesh with our process very well. Now, what you could have done is instead of starting off on your own framework, you could have worked on rails and submitted pushes and improved yeah. it. So, um, two issues with that. Cause, cause I did think about that. Um, one was it's, Pacquiao is fundamentally different. What I wanted in a web framework was different than Rails, but it wasn't just different than Rails. It was different than every other web framework out there. It's just fundamentally Com different. Complete architecture change. Yes. And I did look at back filling that into Rails um, and sort of leveraging what they had done and quickly decided that it was going to be more work to try to make it work within Rails than just to start over um, right. from the ground up. So one of the reasons that I decided to start working on Pacquiao, I guess it, a dissatisfaction that I have with Rails is that it didn't work with our process. And now, did this is like your development process. Is this like agile type process? For customers. Yeah. You could call it agile. It's little a agile, not well, everybody has their own flavor of agile. So the way, yeah. So the way we work with our customers is we want to get them something that they can experience and use as early on in the project as possible. Right. Which is really the whole goal of agile. Right. And the way we do that is through prototyping. So we'll take a feature, the, the most important feature of an application, and we'll build a front end prototype of that for them. And you, you know, it can be as little as, a day or two, maybe as long as a week, and we'll deliver that to them. And they can open up their browser, navigate to it, click around, use the feature in their web browser. This is all under a week. Under a week. And uh, we've not invested a lot of time into it, and we can iter really quickly iterate on the front end of that feature, the user experience for that feature. And once we go through a few iterations of that, then we'll commit and make the feature actually work, add the back end to it, hook it up to the database, those sorts of things. And when we used Rails for that, it was sort of, um, we were always working against the tool because to build a front end prototype, we actually had to write a lot of back end code to make that prototype work. And then once we were ready to build the back end for this prototype feature, we had to rip a lot of stuff out that we had sort of added in there to prop up the prototype. We had to take all of that out and replace it with other code. And so we, we felt like we were building the thing twice. Um, instead of it being this fluid process that builds on itself over time, we just kept having to rip Are you pieces out. So the rapid under a week prototype, you know, that you get to the customer to play with, were you just kind of simulating the back end? Mm -hmm. Yep. Now, there are tools to help you do that, you know, wireframes and yep. walkthrough type deals. Were you just trying to go for something that felt a little more native than just giving them that? Yeah, it needs to feel exactly native. We had tried those wireframing tools and things like that. And the, the issue that we had with that was we would get sign off on the wireframe and then we'd build it for real. And then they'd, they'd have totally new feedback that they wouldn't have been able oh. to give us based on their usage of the wireframe. So it's a poor simulation. It's a poor simulation. So Rails Rails was not quite doing the job for you. Right. Rails wasn't cutting it. We were fighting against the tool. So I wanted to be able to build a front-end prototype writing just HTML code um, without writing. I didn't want to write any Ruby code to make the prototype work, and but create this navigable front-end prototype in HTML. And so that was the first thing that we solved with Pacquiao, was doing that. Um, Would you call that the template engine? That's yeah, Pacquiao's template engine. Okay. So it, it is still a template engine. You still get layouts, and you still have pages, and you have partials, and you get this really nice composable front end where you right. can create your pieces and then compose them together into different pages for your application. Um, but you don't have to write any back end code to express that, which is really nice. 
So that was the first problem we solved in Pacquiao. And then we started building the back end. So let's, you know, let's make it possible to write the back end code without ever having to go back and change any of the front end views that we had built. So what that means is that you can have a designer or a design team work on the front end prototype. And then you can, after that's signed off on and approved, you can have a back end developer, a back end team write the back end for this feature and those backend developers n should never have to go back into the views and make any changes. So you're trying to make it more of an assembly line process. Right. Right. So that, that's a tough goal. It's a tough goal. And it's, that's I, why it was a totally different architecture than everything right. else. Right. Every web app that I put together, I mean, the, the back end, the front end, I mean, it's model view controller, right. but the three are very much joined and you yeah. it's hard to touch one and not the other yeah so the way we did that is um in your views you describe the the underlying data that the view represents so if you're look if you have a, a page if you're building a blog in pacquiao or something like that and you have a page that represents the blog post um, in that html you're gonna you're gonna write special attributes that say this part of the HTML represents a blog post. Right, and you pin that to the metadata of the HTML tag. Right, yeah. So this rep this node represents a blog post. This re post or this node represents the title of a post or the body of a post or the date of a post. So when you give the prototype to the user, you know the first week prototype, mm -hmm. you're concentrating mostly on phase one where you're building the view. Right, and then they sign off for that. Okay, so you can do whatever you need they want done to the view and now you can move on to phase two where you start working on back end logic with the idea that you're not having to touch the signed off view. Right. And it does a lot of things. One, it's just easier to write that kind of code. Yes, um, it is. You write a lot less code, um, but also it gives people areas that they can work in. You know, a lot of front end developers aren't comfortable writing Ruby code. And if, so in Rails, you have this thing called ERB, and it's HTML with Ruby code mixed in. And so if a front-end developer writes the HTML, and then later the back-end developer comes in and sprinkles in Ruby code and that HTML to make it do things, not every front-end developer is comfortable with that. And they're not comfortable like thinking about the Ruby code or reasoning through it and understanding what it's doing, and it's pretty fragile. Is it, they get the idea of they've spent all this time on this gorgeous view and now you're messing it up? Is... Right. Yeah, so it's breaking, having this clear line of separation between the structure of the view and the logic of the view um, and defining them in two separate places just has a ton of benefits. Um, we keep discovering benefits, one that we didn't see at first, but we quickly realized is that this complete structural logical separation made it possible to completely refactor the front end of the application without changing any of the back end code. So you could rip the view out, build a new view, and as long as it still represented the same data of the application, which is mostly that, gonna be true. But that's the goal of most model model view controller yep. structures. It is. Now, and uh, Rails has some form of that. Do you think? Do you feel like you're just solving that problem better with Pacquiao? Than yeah, Rails did. I think so because inevitably you do have logic in your Rails views. Um, it's view rendering logic, but it's still logic. Right. You loop over a data set to right. populate the select list. Right. And so, and for us, that view logic is that's a no-no on your end. It's separated from the view completely. And so, instead of saying repeat. Well, it's, it's sort of the, you're still expressing the same thing. You're still saying, like, repeat this node um, for this data, but you're expressing that in context of the data instead of the view. So it's still quote unquote view logic, but it's expressed in terms of the, of the data rather than expressed as uh, in terms of like the view structure. I, I've noticed that Pacquiao, um, mm -hmm. in the demos that I've seen and in the documentation, has a strong emphasis on real time. 
And with Open Huntsville, it looks as that that entire feature set is just abandoned. I mean, I don't really see any real time application going on there. Is is there? Do you have something down the road that you were thinking of using that for? Or is that just a side feature you're not using? So you know, something like real time. It, it, you know, it, I mean, I guess it could be used for profiles and everything. Oh, you know, uh, Dan updated to say that you know. He, he's worked somewhere for, for seven years instead of six. But, but I think you know, where you're really going to gain uh, the, get, get the best results is putting it in somewhere like messaging or you know, if, if you had a, a feed of, of, of something or, or chat. Right, that was, that was the exam, example he showed. He basically built a real-time chat engine you know, mm -hmm. pretty, pretty swiftly. Mm -hmm. But you're not using it for that. You're use, for you, it, it is model view controller engine. At this point, yes. Okay. Yes. I watched you do a Pacquiao demo. Yep. And what I thought was very interesting is when you just made it real time by doing dot subscribe. I thought that was interesting because I've worked with a lot of real time stuff and I've worked a lot with web sockets and I know the the, the massive complications and difficulties of maintaining live updates in real time and web sockets and it's just a huge pain and yeah and what level of effort are you putting into that real time capability is this a, a compelling feature for Pacquiao you want Pacquiao to be known for real time yeah it's I see it as bringing real time the real time web um, making it accessible to everyone no, no matter how good of a developer you are. I haven't done much with Rails. Does Rails have weak real-time support? Yeah, it doesn't have any real-time support. They're working on this thing called Action Cable, which brings WebSockets to Rails, but it still doesn't do the same thing. It doesn't handle um, like real-time view updates. Does, does Pacquiao expect a Ruby-based web server with the WebSocket engine that Ruby uses? Um, it ships with that by default, so as a Pacquiao 0.10 app supports WebSockets natively. Um, there's actually no other process that you have to run. If you start the application, it is smart enough to... Um, right, it passes the... It hijacks the request and creates a socket. Well, the way it works is the, the TCP connection comes in and then it sees that whether it's a standard web protocol, you know, to fetch the HTTP, or if it's a WebSocket request and routes that through the WebSocket engine. So I assume that's what Pacquiao's doing. Yeah. And is that a native feature of a Ruby server that you've hooked into? No, it's it's all built into the Pacquiao framework. So would you call Pacquiao having a Pacquiao server that you expect to run? Yeah. So the way you run Pacquiao in production is you have one or more Pacquiao application servers running. And then you reverse proxy to that. So you set up a reverse proxy in Nginx or Apache, and it's going to forward traffic to one of those app instances, basically. Okay, so this is probably a web service that you would only expect on uh, some fairly recent virtualized environments, such as a, you know, a VPS or Heroku or or that kind of thing. Is that right? Yeah, you can run. Yeah, you can run Pacquiao on any VPS. You can run it on Heroku. Right. I wouldn't expect a shared service provider to put a custom server on there. No, you couldn't run it on the shared host. Um, we run ours on Rackspace, DigitalOcean, Linode, Heroku, AWS. Right. Do you think that is going to hinder adoption? Because Every cheap host out there is probably either Rails, if they're lucky, or PHP only. Yeah, that's a fair question. We've put a lot of thought into that, and um, we're addressing it. So, so, yes, setting up a VPS is harder than using a shared host, um, but it doesn't have to be. There's really good tooling around setting them up. So we're actually working on a new tool that will automatically provision a, provision a VPS server on your provider of choice and deploy your Pacquiao application to it. What's the name of that tool? Uh, the tool is called Console. And 
console, it attaches to a Packet application, it runs in your browser, it runs locally. And so setting up the VPS, provisioning the VPS, and deploying the application all happens with one click. There's really nothing for the user to hear. Are you partnering with a VPS provider to do this? No, so we're just gonna support um, multiple providers. Right now it supports Heroku um, and we're using that for internal development and testing but it will ship with support for at least Heroku, Linode, and DigitalOcean. Are you essentially scripting the providers to spin up the, v the VPS and or are they going to punch in their credentials and you spin it up for them? Yeah, so they'll they'll need to enter their DigitalOcean or, or Linode or Heroku credentials. But after that, we'll create the server for them. We'll set every, set up the environment. Set up, install all the libraries. Correct. Okay. And we're working on a containerized infrastructure built on Docker. And that will have a large role to play in this tool. Is this all on the... Things I need to get done for Pacquiao 1.0. Uh, yeah, we're gonna have a the first release of console will go along with Pacquiao 1.0. Um, so yeah, it's it's another one of the things that we got to get done. Let's talk more about real time. Real time, yes. Pacquiao 0.10 ships with support for WebSockets natively. You don't have to think about handling WebSockets. All of that's done for you. Pacquiao 0.10 also ships with a client-side JavaScript library called Ring. And all of Pacquiao and Ring works together to bring real-time UI updates to your Pacquiao application. And as a developer, you don't have to write the code that does it. It's all handled by Pacquiao itself. So what that means is that, uh, so the warm-up tutorial actually does this. It takes, takes you through building a chat application uh, like you know if you and i were on the page we could send messages back and forth and i would see your messages without refreshing the page and you would see mine have you timed just what the latency is yeah i mean it's milliseconds right because it's just going up through a web socket and then down a web socket so whatever the time it takes to get routed through the server yeah is the amount of time it takes and uh you know, the warm-up takes less than half an hour to go through and you're building this real-time application. It's just a few lines of, of code. You don't have to write any JavaScript to make it happen. Do you have any real-world examples of this real-time capabilities being used? Yeah, we just rolled out a big project for Hudson Alpha um, supporting their new genomic clinic. Is that behind a blocked portal? It is. Uh, it's for their customers only. Is there something public that we can look at to see? No, there's not. We're working on a on a big case study for the Metabon site, and that will cover it in, in a lot of detail. But there's nothing today to okay. go look. Um, but it has you know a telemedicine aspect. Um, we're doing a lot of WebRTC things for real time video chat. Um, so, is there a limitation to what real time piece you could put in there? I mean, could I have a a changing image and that will get slid over and yeah literally anything that's rendered anything that Pacquiao can render can be updated in real time what happens if I change a big fat video file that I get sent up the pipe and updated mm -hmm. yeah it will and it's just up to the browser to <laughs> do the right thing that'd be fun that'd be interesting <laughs> yeah you can you can do anything so the idea behind Pacquiao UI is the logic that you write to render the view initially is enough to render changes to the view. So that same view logic can be used to also render changes. Right. You just basically flag this piece of the dome as real time. Yeah. You flag it as real time. It's essentially subscribed to any future changes in state that occur that would cause it to re-render. And when that state changes, Pacquiao knows what logic to execute to perform a re-render. And that builds up a set of transformations. So we're not actually doing a full re-render on the server and pushing down HTML. Okay. We're building up, we're executing the, the view logic. And we're, from that, we're, we're building up a set of transformations. 
And these transformations are just instructions um, for how the client should change itself in order to reflect the new state. Right. And your presentation said it was just sending diffs. Just diffs. Right. So it's like, here's, here's the set of changes that you need to make to yourself so that you reflect. Here's the diff, here's the location, make the change. Right. And so that's pushed down the WebSocket to any client that needs to update itself and ring intercepts those instructions and applies those and evaluates the instructions and makes the the DOM changes. Do you have a timeline? Do you, when, when we can expect a 1.0, when I can start moving everything in the pack, yeah, drop my shared server and all that good stuff. Uh, you should start thinking about it now. Um, I don't know. We're working really hard on it. Um, I really hope that it's the first quarter of next year. So, yeah, you have one and a half full-time people working on it. If uh, 2016 is going to be similar to 2015. Yeah, and we've actually had more people working on it recently. So we've, we've sort of reallocated a lot of resources to make it happen. Say I am a non-developer, and I think this is interesting. Is there a way that a non-developer could help with the project? Yeah. Um, we actually, I, I've been pinging um, non-developers a lot lately and having them look at the website, read through the documentation. We have a warm-up tutorial. Um, I'll have people go through that and provide feedback. Um, that's the best way uh, for a non-developer to get involved today. And that's the show. A big thank you to Brian Powell. He's on Twitter at Brian P. That's Brian with a Y. And Cal Newman is at S-K-Y-L-E Newman. I'm at Nagel Code. Pacquiao can be found at P-A-K-Y-O-W dot org. Everything will be linked in the show notes. Until next time, this is My Code is Broken, and I'm Dan Nagel, signing off. I'm getting, I'm getting the projects mixed up. <laughs> Open Huntsville. It, it wasn't really the intent for this episode to be focused so heavily on Open Huntsville. I mean, I think I've mentioned Open Huntsville three out of my four podcasts at least. And it's to the point where I'm thinking, go to openhuntsville.com, click on the microphone, <laughs> and type in my code is broken for 10% off your first freelancer. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's almost to that level. <laughs> but... If, if so, so be it. <laughs>